So I really want to follow up on this story of the power of circles because um, what is going to come next is a piece um, that Chuck Derry and Ed Heisler, um, who is the executive director of Menace Peacemakers, are going to talk about this um, issue in a different way. But what we know in almost every movement is that small group of people who start talking to their circle and their circle starts changing and their circle talks to other people and they change. Um, uh, it, all you have to do really is look at the domestic violence movement and watch how really in Duluth they came up with a model that has really changed the way people think about the issue of domestic violence, what law enforcement and our attorneys and others do about it, all happened because this small group of women meeting in 1982, I think, or somewhere in the early 80s, who were themselves battered, started talking to one another, and out of that grew something that really is remarkable. And I know that Mending the Sacred Poop came out of the Native women who were part of that initial group and then was built and in a sense, the, um, what we are doing at Dabanu again, I think I got it right that time. <laughs> um, I tried it several times, but I, when I got up in front of everybody, I lost my ability. So, um, so it, out of that work came the idea that we had to provide shelter for people. And that shelter was an incredibly important Thing to allow people to get away and have a safe space. And so in both cases, um, in ACO the, um, and in Mending the Sacred Hoop, it's work that really has given Native women in this area and, um, and really Native people a voice um, to take action in this. So our next speakers are Chuck Derry, who's one of the principals in the Gender Violence Institute and was with me, the founder of the Minnesota Men's Action Network, the work that we started doing to invite men in, and Ed Heisler, who's the executive director of Men's Peacemakers. All right. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, my name is Ed Heisler, I'm the executive director of Men as Peacemakers, and it is very, very heartwarming to see so many people in the audience today. I just want to thank everyone for taking the time to come out. Um, men as Peacemakers, if you're not aware, is an organization that's focused on engaging men with women uh, in violence prevention and building a peaceful and equitable community. And so this work focused on ending traffic again, fits right into our, right into our mission, right? Um, and the first thing that I, that I really would like to, to say is to thank the women from Mending the Sacred Hoop and ACO and PAVSA who have spoken before us uh, because the reality is that's a really big gift that we've all kind of been given in the room. Um, when it comes to this sort of work, uh, Men as Peacemakers takes the lead from the women who are, who are working on the ground with trafficking victims. And, and the folks who are experiencing this, right? So they're the real experts, and uh, folks like Chuck and I um, get to learn from that, and then uh, work with men to to figure out how we can how we can uh, do some prevention strategies together with women. Um, so I just really want to thank you for your for your time. Oh yeah, you you could have let me go, and it probably would have been a humorous thing. Um, so I want to put out that thanks, and uh, and with that, it looks like Chuck's. Ready to do an introduction here himself. So. Hi, I'm Chuck Derry. Uh, it, yeah, it's great to be here, and thanks, Ed, for inviting me. It's fantastic. Um, I started doing this in 1983, and I'll tell you a little story about that later. Uh, so it's been amazing, and I work with um, in battering and, and uh, some sexual violence, but about a year and a half ago, I started doing the John School at Breaking Free. Down Minneapolis, who helps women get out of uh, prostitution, and uh, the stories I heard from survivors uh, just blew me away. The level of pain, the level of suffering, the level of violence that was happening towards them uh, from Johns and from pimps was just incredible. And the only thing that even comes close to a description of it is torture. 
And um, so it's very, it's very heartening to see that there's more conversation now about trafficking and to see the men in the room who are joining the women who have been leaders on this for many years. Uh, to, we don't know what the potential is of men stepping up with women in partnership to change sexual and domestic violence and trafficking. Because for the most part, we've been sitting on the sidelines being pretty quiet. So what happens when we start standing up with them and speaking, right? I mean, we saw Sarah's got a great, I love that story about your husband. Okay, that's pretty easy. Come on, guy, well, let's not go to the strip clubs because they really don't want to be there and they're being beaten and pistol whipped and, and burned and strangled. Oh, really? Yeah. Let's go to the bar and throw darts. Okay, cool. Better idea. All right? And so that's a lot of what we want to talk about tonight is what is trafficking? What is our role as men to stop the demand? And so one of the things that's going to happen during parts of this conversation is we'll use some language that's pretty raw because we're going to use language that uh, connects with the reality of, of trafficking, prostitution, um, and strip clubs, things like that. Um, as you can kind of tell, we've got two hours for this forum, but we've got a lot of stuff jammed in, so we actually don't have that much time. This isn't the kind of forum that's designed to kind of be an open conversation. We're gonna have opportunities. The idea here is to keep this going, right, and have opportunities for those sorts of conversations to happen in the future. Um, but what we know is that it is going to take a significant commitment from men in this community in order to reduce the demand for sex trafficking uh, here. And so what we want to do is provide some basic information on top of the incredible information that, uh, that folks have already shared, um, and then provide an opportunity for people to, to sign up to show their support for ending sex trafficking, because the Men Against Trafficking group is going to keep going, and we're going to talk about some strategies that we can look at implementing in our communities to help end the demand for sex trafficking here. So you heard Candy describe what sex trafficking is, right? Um, and the thing that I want to key in on here is that sex trafficking is an incredibly damaging form of violence against women and children, right? And it oftentimes includes coercion or violence that's used to force women and children to sell their bodies for the pleasure and the profit of others. That's, that's basically what you've got going on in trafficking, right? And so that creates a very unique relationship where when we're talking about women who are women and children who are sold into prostitution, um, it's absolutely impossible for the conditions that make genuine consent possible to be present because there isn't the level of safety, there's no equality with the customers, and there's no real choice about, uh, about the decisions that get to be made as far as whether to be in trafficking or not. And so con consent isn't possible. And so for men in particular, when we choose to participate in trafficking, um, it really is a choice. We're oftentimes paying money in order to, to rape someone. Right? That's what's going on when there's no consent um, in, in this sort of interaction. And this is something that's happening in Duluth. You heard very significant statistics right, coming from the Garden of Truth reports. Many of those women came from Duluth, as well as from the Point in Time surveys. And one of the things that we know is that when tourist-based sort of activities uh, uh, come up. The demand for sexually exploitative um, businesses, as well as for, uh, for trafficked women and children, also rises. And that can include things like hunting as well. Um, and so trafficking is happening in hotels in this community. It's happening, the connections are being made in bars in this community. As we speak right now, there are people online who are who are looking around, trying to figure out where they can get access to women that they can buy or sell. Um, and we know that there's conversations about the ways in which women and children are moved around the country, and that strip clubs have been central in that conversation about how those women and children are moved. So we've got demand here. We know that we've got uh, women and children who are accessing these great advocacy organizations. We know that this is an issue here, and that there's a business structure set up in order to support it. And that means that there's a lot of work for us to do, right? So there's kind of a basic request that we're putting out there first. And that is for the men in the room to not support trafficking and the prostitution of, of women and children. And you know, for many of us, that may be a fairly basic request, right? Um, but it involves not buying or selling um, women and children, not supporting others who are doing that. 
and not supporting the businesses that are creating the conditions where women and children can be advertised, bought, and sold, and exploited. So that's kind of our foundational request. Uh, for everybody in the room, I don't think that's a surprise, right? So from there, we're going to move on and talk about the broader environment. And how is it that we get a social environment in our community that supports the level of trafficking and violence against women that exists in the first place? Because unfortunately, we live in a reality now where it's becoming more and more normalized for us to live and raise families um, in, in, a normal, in normalized conditions where, um, where children are sexually exploited, particularly girls. And I'll tell you in particular, for this presentation, I tried to find images of, uh, of, of girls that were kind of nice, cute images to put into this presentation. It's not easy to find. Because if you try typing in girls on Google Images, what you're going to get is some really highly sexualized pictures of girls and young women. Right? So this is, a, this is the first problem. Um, then beyond that, we're raising our families and our, and our children, and we're living in, a, in an environment, a community environment, where we continue to have gender inequality. And so children are growing up into a reality where women continue to be um, to be leveraged, to be exploited, um, to be objectified, and, and to, be, to be used. Um, and so that's another part of this equation, right? And so that really puts a big burden on us as men in thinking about the decisions that we're making. Um, because whether it's conscious or unconscious, there's a question about to what degree have we been participating in this environment where gender inequality and exploitation of women has thrived. Uh, and then, to what degree are we invested in either keeping that the same way or changing it? And so that's where we come in, right? Because the whole premise of this event is in the fact that men in this community care about women. And they don't want to see this sort of harm happening to women and children. And so we've got a lot of allies in this room who are not okay with the idea that, um, that the value of a woman comes from her body and that uh, women are, and children are things to be sold and exploited. Um, and so that's what we want to build off of, right? We, can, we, can, we are uniquely positioned to end the demand for trafficking and sexually exploitative activities um, because the demand generally comes from men. So we hold a lot of power in that realm. Um, but that's going to take a personal commitment from men in the room. It's going to take support for the strong and consistent sort of interventions that are being proposed, that you heard Sarah talk about, that you hear the trafficking task force talking about, um, holding offenders accountable, John's accountable, Pip's accountable, and then not prosecuting folks, women who are victimized um, by, by trafficking. Um, and then it's also going to take a commitment to primary prevention and social change, because we have to change the very conditions where women are seen as less equal than men, where the value of women is coming from their bodies and not from their entire character as human beings. Get this working cool. So, um, last time I was in a strip club was um, June of 1983. I was 27, and I went there with my brother. And, uh, you know, I was just going to strip clubs when I was in my 20s and stuff. And this one particular strip club I particularly liked. And so we went there because I wanted to pick up my favorite stripper. Uh, because, and I had my brother with me because he was going to be my best man. I was going to get married in August, right? So this is June. And I'm planning a bachelor party, right? A kick-ass bachelor party. That means strippers, right? So we, we hired some strippers. They came with a great big bouncer with them, of course. We were in the basement of some building, some room. We had 25, 30 guys there. And, um, you know, they stripped down naked. And my brother, who was my best man, sat right next to me. We were in a circle. They were dancing in the mill. And he, had, he must have had a stack of this, I don't know, if it was 50 or 100 $1 bills, right? My brother. And he sat next to me and just kept putting dollars on my lap, one after another, right? I'm going, <laughs> all right. What a brother, right? And so there, 
So then the women, there's two of them, and they were there grinding on me for about an hour and doing dancing and stuff, right? So we did that. And then um, we also had a, um, a deck of cards that we sold. And we sold, the guys would buy it, and it would be five bucks a card. And you could buy as many as you wanted, and the guys bought several of them, right? And then at the end of the night, uh, what we did is take another deck of cards and flip the cards over. And whenever they matched, that guy, and so we did it for two guys, two guys would match. So, so it was probably about an hour and a half, two hour uh, party. And at the end of the night, then the guys who matched up with the cards got to go to the bathroom and get a blowjob from the strippers. Now, my brother and I, that's where we drew the line. You know, we said, no, we're not going to do that. You know, he's married, I'm going to get married. Okay, that's, that's where we drew the line. We're not going to go in the bathroom and get a blowjob from the, from the strippers, right? But we set up the whole thing. You know, oh, that's our line. Yeah. But we set up the whole thing. We brought the cards, we did the five bucks, we did the whole thing, right? And this was like the, this is like the quintessential bachelor party. Right, guys? Isn't it? And it still is. That was 30 years ago. And it still is. This is the quintessential, amazing, incredible bachelor party. Three months later, I started working uh, in a program that dealt with men's violence against women in St. Cloud. Three months later, it was October, November. Totally changed my life. I had no idea about the level of violence that was going on men against women. And I had no idea what was happening to those women who were in the room or stripping in front of us or in, in the strip club when I went there. No idea. Um, I had no idea. You know, you heard Patty's stats. Raped. Beaten. Stomped on. Shoved in trunks. I mean, you, I mean the, the, it goes on and on and on. Uh, when I listen to survivors at Breaking Free's uh, John School, so when I have survivors, will get up and talk to the men who are in the room who have been busted for prostituting women, right? And um, I can't believe some of, them, some of them, after hearing their stories, I can't believe they're even up and walking around because of the torture that's happened to them routinely. And I have no idea. Now, I did know, you know, I could tell, and if you guys, if you've been to strip clubs, I mean, you can tell, or if you're looking at porn, you can kind of tell that the women aren't really that excited about being there. I mean, I could tell when these women are grinding on my knee, you know, that's like, okay, they're not that happy about being here. I mean, they're not that excited, right? But, uh, and maybe it was, it was even bothering them, but I didn't care. I didn't care. I didn't care about her, what was going on with her. Why should I care if she's a stripper? She's a slut, she's a whatever prostitute, right? The only thing I cared about was getting my rocks off and getting pleasure. I didn't care about if there's attachment to pain. Now, I didn't know how much pain, but I could tell that they're uncomfortable sometimes. But I still, I didn't care. Didn't have to care. None of my friends cared either, you know. Then again, like I say, I started working in this in this work and started um, having my eyes open about what it is that was actually happening and and uh, what I was participating in. So how do we look beneath the surface? I mean, the strip club, again, is just so, uh, you know, get a prostitute or prostitute a woman, go to a strip club, go on porn. It's just a normal thing right now that men are doing. And it was normal then, too. This is, uh, Sarah already talked about some of this. But it's like, um, you see this first one? I don't know if you can read this in the back, but many of the chronic physical symptoms of women in prostitution were similar to the physical consequences of torture. Now, women, if you're prostituting a woman, she's going to act like you're the hottest thing ever, guys, right? You're an amazing individual, because she has to. Because she has to bring your money to her boyfriend slash pimp. Otherwise, she's going to get hurt. And the women who are hanging on the strip poles, they better look like they're having a great time, and you're an amazing guy, too. Because they have to. Because if they don't, they're not going to get the money. And there's someone else who wants that money. And if she doesn't have the money for them, they're going to hurt her. Seriously. Right? And so a lot of times it's like invisible right in front of our eyes. The pain. Uh, torture. 75% of the women reported injuries. This is from, uh, this is from Melissa Farley. 75% of the women reported injuries from violence. 50% suffered head injuries. 50% of the women in this research prostitution 
suffered head injuries. How do you get a head injury in prostitution? When you're being trafficked. How do you get head injuries? It happens like this. That's how you get a head injury. It happens like this. I told you fucking bitch. Right? That's how you get head injuries. Guys, and this is what's happening. I'm not giving you the extreme stories. I'm giving you routine stories. That's what was amazing to me. Um, you know, I was 27 years old. I, I, I didn't have a clue. Um, Sarah, I already talked to, and Ed talked about the multiple locations that women are trafficked, right? Hotels, online. Um, talked about half the women in Guard of Truth uh, research, half of them were there because they're uh, uh, need to survive and under the control of a pimp or a gang, often many of them. 79%, um, I'll just repeat these because they bear repeating, because I think hearing them at first, they don't sink in, especially for guys. I think for the women, of course, it sinks in. But for men, it's harder to sink in, I think. 79% have been sexually assaulted on an average of four perpetrators. 92% have been raped. 84% physically assaulted. You know, 92% um, want to leave. So when we think that they're there for a choice, we're mistaken. They're not there by choice. Many of them are not there by choice. This is women not uh, prostituted in um, Mexico. Um, so then the question is for us as men, is do we care about women's lives? Do we care about women? Right? I mean, that's what it came down to me. How am I going to take my pleasure? Right? I had to decide to stop going to strip clubs. Because I decided, no, I'm not going to take my, I knew about the pain now. I couldn't ignore it. I'm going to take my pleasure at her pain? No, I decided not to. And it was pleasurable. It's very pleasurable. But I decided, no, that's not how I want to take my pleasure. I can have pleasure. I can have sexual pleasure with women without them being hurt. Right? The same thing with pornography. How much violence is pornography? And am I willing to stop using porn? Because that gives me a lot of pleasure too. But when I start knowing who's hurt and how badly they're hurt, and what it's doing to me, and how I think about women, women in my relationship, women I know and love and care about, and women who I just pass on the street, uh, then I begin to make informed decisions about who I want to be as a man, and how I want to be, and how we taught as men uh, to treat women. And we talked about racism and, and the ways in which trafficking is that is impacted by racism. And how a lot of times you have strip clubs, for instance, I'll use it as an example. You'll have strip clubs in, uh, you know, they're always uh, a lot of times placed in uh, low-income areas in a lot of cities, many of which are populated by uh, communities of color or native folks because of the economic realities of racism, right? And then I never forget the story that's told at the John School of Breaking Free about the grandmother uh, in St. Paul, neighborhood in St. Paul, walking with her like two, two and a half year old grandson. And they're just walking down the street in their neighborhood, right? And uh, the two and a half year old, you know, he's like this, you know, he's, uh, he's cute little thing. And they see something on the ground, they always put stuff in their mouth, right? So they reach down and grab this thing he thought was a piece of gum, puts it in his mouth, starts chewing on it, and of course it's a used condom, right? Because of the trafficking that's happening in that neighborhood. You talk to uh, native uh, women and girls, native girls down in Minneapolis going to high school, they can't even walk to high school anymore because you've got suburban white guys coming in and uh, hitting them up, soliciting them. They now, uh, one of the schools down there has a project where they have the boys in the high school are working with the women where the boys are actually, the native boys are actually escorting the girls to the bus or escorting them home because the girls are so routinely getting uh, solicited. And what that means is a guy's just pulling over and yelling up, you know, talking obscenities out the car. Oh, hey baby, how about a little so-and-so, you want a little money? They're 15, they're 14, they're 13. They're going to school. I talked to people up in, um, uh, I work in Bemidji and talked to folks from Leech Lake Reservation and also some folks, child protection folks down in Park Rapids. And out in North Dakota and Williston area where they have the big um, oil fields, and they have the man, what they call man camps, 
the trafficking that's flowing through here, through uh, Fargo, Moorhead, and into Williston is amazing. And the abductions that are happening, they're talking about the native girls, little girls that are being abducted off the reservations and they're being abducted in other places. And part of why the pimps are going after the traffickers are going after the native girls because of racism, the officials are not paying that much attention to native girls and girls of color. So the traffickers know that. And so that's why they go and they abduct them. So this is the, if we, if we participate in strip clubs, if we participate in prostitution in any way, we are part of this um, business and this level of harm. Uh, and, and even when we start making jokes about it with our friend, we make offhand comments about that woman and what we'd like to do with her, right? Or we make comments about bitches or sluts or hoes, right? It adds to this environment in which uh, women are assaulted, women are trafficked. And so we get to choose, we can change that. We have a lot of um, influence and power, especially with other men. Men don't often listen to women when we talk about this, but they'll listen to other men because of sexism. And so as men, collectively, we have some influence that we can use. And we're oftentimes in positions of power and policy and other places that we can use our positions of power to make some changes. But it all comes down to do we care? Do we actually care? So, um, <clears throat> The second kind of area of focus that we're going to look at is pornography. And there's a reason for that, that that's a specific place that we need to focus if we want to talk about ending the demand for trafficking. Um, and that's for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that pornography is famous for utilizing trafficked women in order to create its product. It's more profitable that way, right? Um, the other is that uh, pornography, by its very definition, is material that objectifies and exploits its subjects while eroticizing domination, degradation, and violence. So we don't really care, you know, we don't have, I don't have a stance, I don't have any problem with sexually um, explicit material, um, but I have a big problem with material that objectifies and exploits people and eroticizes violence. And so if we, as folks who want to end the demand and end sex trafficking, um, are, are looking for a place to focus on what makes so much sex trafficking possible. Pornography is one of the great sort of commercial, normal, accepted industries in our, in our society, in our culture, um, that helps to promote that. And I was about this age when I first uh, was exposed to pornography. I guess in my case, it was probably about 10 years, 11 years old. And I consider myself to be a fairly unique case because uh, I grew up right when the first homes were getting internet, right? So I can remember when my first friend got, got internet in his house, and I remember it taking him about one day before he figured out that he had access to internet porn. Um, and so as soon as we figured that out, right, then there were a group of us who were coming and, and watching that on a pretty regular basis for a period of time. And we'd come, we'd, we'd be there, he'd be showing the sites that he found, and if you remember back then when you'd open a site like that, you'd get about 10, 12 pop-ups that came up with it, right? So window after window of porn kind of playing all at once. But to get into the porn, you needed to do some shopping first. And we got really educated in kind of the language of pornography. So we had to pick what kind of women we wanted to be watching, what was their race, what sort of body type, what sort of age, what sort of category of their behavior we want to look for, what kind of sex did we want to watch, how did we want to, what sort of body parts did we want to focus on, Right? All of that was stuff that we kind of shopped for. And then what would happen is we'd watch men have really icky, dominating, degrading, oftentimes violent, to be honest, sex with women. And that's how I view it now. At the time, I thought it was just sex. I was 10, 11 years old. I hadn't seen any other examples of what sex was. For many but myself and many of my friends, um, this was the, 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 the kind of the, the main form of uh, sex education that we were gonna get until our adult lives. And so to us, this was just the normal version of what, of what sex was. And so it's really no surprise to me, looking back on it now, that when we got to high school, 
it was pretty normal for us to be talking about women in some pretty violent <coughs> and derogatory and degrading ways, and to be talking about our girlfriends in the ways about either how do we get them to sleep with us or how do we get them to sleep with us in ways that we want them to, and kind of their main value coming from whether or not they, they put out in the time that, that we wanted them to. Um, it's also not surprising to me that I know of at least a couple of my friends whose first sexual experiences were pretty violent. And in one of those cases, at least, his partner also thought that that was normal, right? So they're having violence as a part of their sexual experience because of the influence of seeing pornography and that being the main, um, the main sex ed that was happening. Um, and so one of the things that I think about is the way in which this has been going on forever and ever, but in the case of my generation, there's an entire generation of youth that are growing up to tie their sexuality, their idea of what men are, what women are, what relationships are, and what sex are, to the influence of pornography and sexually exploitative and, and, uh, and violent um, imagery, right? And that does a couple of things. It certainly perpetuates a society that doesn't view men and women as equals and that sees the value of women as coming from their bodies and the pleasures that they give. But the other thing that it does is it creates a solid market for these exploitative industries, including trafficking. Right, because it's the same sort of root belief system, the same sort of root um, beliefs about pleasure in women and sex that that go into pornography, that would go into buying and selling women and children. This was a study that was done in Boston in 2007 about pornography and um, the violence in pornography. And they took 250 of the top-grossing pornographic contemporary pornographic films, and then they randomly pulled 50 out of there, and then they coded every behavior in the porn for aggression and non-aggression. So if the guy walks in and shakes her hand, woman's hand, and kisses her on the cheek, you know, okay, non-aggressive. Grabs her, throws her down, rapes her, obviously aggression, right? They, they, every single act, verbal and physical aggression, and found out that 90% of every act in pornography was aggressive in nature. 90% in contemporary pornography. That's what porn is now, 90%. And no, no kind of, uh, the aggression was rewarded 68% of the time, and the rest of it was neutral, no, no question about it. And this isn't hard to, I mean, this is easy to understand if you've ever looked at porn and you go online, right? It's very, very quickly you get language like, this little bitch can't get enough, this little slut. Right, guys? It's, this is routine on porn. And so this is what we've got now. So here we have uh, little boys growing up, learning about sexuality like Ed's talking about, and this is what they're learning. Now in the past, there used to be some disconnect in the 60s and 70s, some, some not a lot, but some disconnect between the violence and the sex. That is gone. There is no disconnect. Men who use pornography do that to orgasm. That's why men use porn. Right? You cannot be using porn anymore and coming to orgasm without being totally aroused by the pain, by the violence, because you can't separate it out anymore. Right? We're taking some of the most powerful pleasure centers in a man's body, heart, and mind and tying it directly to women's pain. We're eroticizing that pain. Uh, it was amazing to me when I stopped using porn. And this was before, you know, even the video stores, much less online, right? And how long it took me to stop using porn, and then how my attitude towards women shifted when I stopped using porn. If you talk to people who did this, the people who did this, they had graduate students who did this, the women and the men both, they had to go into therapy after they did this because they were watching films alone in their homes and making, these, making this, this research. They, they all ended up going to therapy because of depression. Right? This is not uncommon for people who do this type of research. It's common, in fact. Uh, the other thing is that the men and the women both, the young men and women both said that they would have, they'd be walking down the street, this hadn't happened to them before, they're walking down the street and a woman would be approaching, and all of a sudden, bam, they'd get this image from porn of this woman. And that was routine. And that's one of the things that I recognized myself when I was using porn, and I didn't use a lot of porn, and it was magazines, Playboy, Penthouse, Hustler was really bad then, you know. Uh, but still, it influenced how I thought about, viewed women, 
right? Objectified women. Um, right now, these little boys, these boys have access to, to images I could not have access in pornography now. They have access to imagery and movies that I couldn't touch when I was 20 years old, unless I came, went down the cities and you know, found the mob or went to Mexico City and found the mob. I couldn't get anywhere near the imagery that these boys can go five clicks, click, 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 click. And they're into very, very uh, dangerous and violent imagery about women, right? Uh, so the accessibility is, is amazing. This is what they're seeing. And it's not just sticking in porn, it's not just staying in porn, it's going into the community. We're seeing this more and more how the pornification of the culture. How we're seeing trafficking and, and pornography and women as sexualized objects uh, is becoming more and more extreme. And many of you know what I'm talking about when you look at media. But this is just a, one example we used. This is in Minneapolis, a billboard in Minneapolis uh, three summers ago. Fast, cheap, and satisfaction yet guaranteed. There's high speed internet, right? So this is just becoming normal. It's kind of funny. It's kind of a joke. It's just kind of fun, right? Uh, how many of you have been to Target Field down the cities to see a Twins game? When you get off the light rail at Target Field, get off the light rail, I got my 9-year-old son, my 11-year-old my daughter, my 13-year-old daughter, and right there where that wall is, about this far away, is that sign. They built Target Field in the middle of the warehouse district. There are 13 strip clubs within walking distance of Target Field. How many of you have been to a game down there and been solicited by an owner of a strip club saying you bring in a game ticket and you'll get a free, uh, free drink or free admission or free lap dance? Anybody? Yeah, that's right. They're down there <coughs> with the men. So here I am with my family. Now, what I think is interesting is look at this branding. You know what I mean by branding? You know, it's this great marketing. If you say a word, something comes to mind. Like if I say hamburger, what comes to mind? McDonald's? Yeah, beautiful, beautiful uh, branded, right? Look at this branded, <clears throat> Twins Sex World. So what are these, like these um, mythic kinds of values, American values, mom, apple pie, baseball, and now strip clubs? So if I'm going to a strip club with my mom, if I'm going to a baseball game with my mom and dad, family outing, I'm a nine-year-old boy, and I'm surrounded by strip clubs, and that's, I grow up, in this environment of this family outing in the middle of the warehouse district, why wouldn't I go to strip clubs? It's just normal. It's just, it's kind of cool actually. Not only is it normal, but it's cool. And what is the little girl who's nine year old learning about herself? And what's her value? How is she valued, right? Based on what? Body, period and our access, men's access, to her body. So as we begin to look at this, we look more and more deeply into male socialization. So, you know, Chuck's doing a great job kind of showing how normalized the pornification and the exploitation of women are in our culture and then tying that to these kind of local examples in the Twin Cities. Um, and the reality is that no matter where you come from, urban, rural, in the United States, the reality is that for men, socialization is going to include um, elements of this exploitation, domination, um, violence towards women. Um, and that you can see the, that in these images. This thing on the top left that you see up there, um, that's from one of the top websites. It's supposed to be a humor website that's marketed to teenage and college age boys. And it was the number one clicked on image in July of this year. If you look at the bottom, we've got just kind of normal stuff that comes up with, uh, with uh, um, video game advertisements there. And then this uh, poster here that says, fatherhood, if you kill that hooker, you can get your money back. So that's a reference to the game Grand Theft Auto. Grand Theft Auto, of course, is one of the most economically successful video games ever created, um, but it includes a component where you can um, pick up a woman who is being prostituted, and then if you want to get your, your money back, what you do is you kill her. That's a really normal aspect of, 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 of that game. If we look at this collage, this is from Stuff in Maxim magazines, and it's a collage of the images of women that existed in that uh, in that magazine, their key demographic is teenage 
and young adult men. And you notice how stripped down, how sexualized, how posed they are, and how focused on individual parts of their bodies all of these images are, right? So the value of this, these women comes specifically from their bodies. Oops. And then it's no mistake that when you look at this poster up here, beautiful eyes, too bad nobody's looking at them. Um, but that's a common sort of sentiment, right? Based on the socialization. And then the reality is, and we've been talking about this for the whole presentation, so it's no surprise, but it's a normal thing in our, in our communities to talk about buying women um, for the pleasure of, of men. That's just a normal part of what we do. Um, and if you have listened to this presentation, aren't sure if that's true yet, what you can think about, for instance, is the fact that the tourist center of this town contains one strip club there and then lighted signs that oftentimes advertise other strip clubs in the surrounding area, right? So this is a very normal part of the way that we exist in a community. And so we've got some work to do. Quite literally, there is an environment that supports the exploitation, the sale, the domination, the inequality of women and children. And something needs to be done about that. The sooner that we realize that this is about an environment that is promoting the value of women coming from their bodies and from uh, uh, that value um, being accessible to men, kind of being the central thing that we care about, and that that's enforced through violence, the sooner that we can kind of understand that that's what's going on in our environment, the sooner we can start to make an impact on things like, uh, like sex trafficking, women and children who are prostituted, um, and the like. And so, by the way, you know, we're talking about this broader environment, some of the beliefs and the norms that are supporting the sex trafficking that we see in our community, but they're related to these other issues too, right? If the value of women comes from um, comes from their bodies and the access that men have to their bodies, it's no surprise that one in three women in Minnesota are reporting sexual violence, right? Because that's, that's what the purpose of women are. That's one of the beliefs that comes out of that. Um, similarly, um, if the value of women comes from the degree to which they create pleasure, serve the interests of men, it's no mistake that one in three women have been a victim of intimate partner violence by the time they turn 40, because violence is what helps to uphold that order, right? For folks who are gonna to subscribe to those, to those beliefs. And so these problems are interconnected, and they have to do with sexism and male dominance. And so what we wanna talk about here is prevention, right? How do we get upstream from this so that we can stop the harm before it starts? That's what reducing the demand is, right? Stopping the harm, undercutting the ability to, to, to have so much harm in our community through trafficking, and through other issues of exploitation. And we've got some specific ways of thinking about doing that, and most of them are strategies that really specifically utilize the spectrum of prevention. And the spectrum of prevention is a public health tool. This is something that the Men Against Trafficking group can kind of explore in more depth in the future because we don't want to take too much time. But to just briefly go over it, the power of it comes from focusing both on the awareness raising and the educating, like we're doing here tonight, but also thinking about how to utilize the power of policy and organizational practice in order to reshape the environment that exists in our communities, the way that people behave, the values and the beliefs that people hold. And so when we talk about the, uh, violent, the, the um, trafficking prevention strategies that we have, um, you'll notice that they all contain components that get to the, to the levels of changing organizational practice and policy. This is a, um, a graphic that came out of Sacred Circle. It was a um, national uh, resource center for working in tribal communities. And the thing I like about this is that when I've worked on this work for some years and talked to men, for instance, talk, I used to do men's uh, batterers groups. Men are busted for battering, and we talk about this. And guys would say, you know, Chuck, it's always been this way. You're never going to stop it. Men have been beating and raping women for centuries. Sometimes a guy would wave a Bible at me and stuff and say, hey, it says in the Bible, guys, you know, and I'd say, uh, that's true. Uh, and, you know, what's the, the, what's the, the um, saying, you know, uh, prostitution is the old, oldest profession, right? This comes up all the time. So people think it's impossible to change. I always like the comment that says um, it's the oldest oppression. I don't know if that's a nice switch there, flip on that one. But people say it's impossible. 
Guys are always going to use porn. They're always going to use strip clubs. They're always going to rape and beat women, you know. And what I would say to them is, you know, it's true, and this is for just general groups of men as well in communities, not just men who batter. We'll say this. It's always been this way. And what I would say to them is that, you know, it's true that in some cultures, men have been beating and raping women for centuries, even thousands of years, but not here. Not on this continent. Not where we're sitting right here tonight. This is new here. This is only about 150, 200 years old here. My people brought it here. So this is a nice, I thought this is a nice um, graphic about you know, native, traditional native life ways and the belief systems. Understand that all things have spirits and are related. Uh, respect is the foundation of all relationships. Women are sacred. And then Europeans came over and we brought this. Other kinds of roots. I mean, these roots, you get some fruit, like respect, humility, understanding, laughter, peace, compassion, honoring, courage, sovereignty. Here we have other values. Um, might makes right. The idea of dominance, power is defined as violence and dominance, rather than power over someone, rather than power with somebody. Um, men should be in charge. Reality is male-dominated hierarchy, right? And so we get this fruit. Racism and homophobia and trafficking and great violence. Um, so the point about this for me is that, um, yeah, this is possible to change. In fact, for thousands of years on this continent where we're standing, women or men are pretty chill with each other. It wasn't just like 60 years where the guys are hip with the women. No, it was for thousands of years. Thousands of years, right? So there's no question about whether this can change. It can change. The question is whether we, as men, and people of influence will partner with women to make that change, whether we care. So here's some ideas that we can do. So some of these are pretty obvious. Don't act sexually exploit women. So stop using porn. Stop going to strip clubs. Stop prostituting women. Um, stop laughing at the jokes. Stop being quiet when the jokes are made. A lot of times guys will be with friends and stuff, and some guy will make some rude, sexist joke. And the other guy will sit there and be quiet. And he thinks that if he's quiet, then the guy knows he doesn't like sexist jokes. That's not true. One guy telling a sexist joke to another guy, they just assume that you like sexist jokes. What he's thinking is that you just didn't like that sexist joke. So you have to speak. It's just like white people with white people around racism. If you have a white person telling you a racist comment, you don't say anything. They just think you didn't like that racist joke. So we have to speak. There's no neutral position here. Right? So how do we begin to uh, interrupt the jokes and comments? How do we use our influence to change the norms? We're, uh, there are four, at least four elected officials in this room. What are public policies that could change that have dramatic impact on trafficking? Uh, changing organizational practices. Remember smoking? A lot of times people think the way you do this is just awareness. Yeah, this is about awareness tonight, but the question is what are you going to do with your awareness, guys? So you're aware, what are you, you going to do with it then, right? If we only do awareness and education, like smoking, we tell people that lung cancer doesn't, you know, it kills you. All right, smoking gives you lung cancer. People did not really stop, and we didn't change the norm of smoking. Like 30 years ago, I've been having a cigarette here while we're talking, and there'd be a number of people in here smoking. That was the norm, right? That didn't change until we had workplaces that said you can't smoke here anymore, right? And then we had laws. That's a smoke-free environment. And so the, the major impact that we can make is changing the environment is this way. Also, and not to diminish the individual stuff, like listen to women. How many guys, how many of you have ever listened to a woman that you care about tell you about what it's like to live in this environment? Isn't that amazing? What's it like, like the fear but that they have to maneuver and manage? And how about anger? How many of you listen to women that you care about, talk about their anger about living in this, right? And just listen, and just, and not like listen and then say, yeah, you shouldn't feel that way, but actually listen and say, tell me more about that. I wanna know more about that. I know when, when I've done that, and I had to learn how to do that. It took me two years actually to learn how to listen to women. I was working 40 hours a week in a feminist women's organization. It took me two years to actually learn how to listen to women. <laughs> you know, amazing. Uh, but one of the things that happened when I learned how to listen to their anger, just listen to it, a lot of times what would come 
is the pain right behind the anger. All the pain. And that's what, what that's what shifted my heart. Right? The anger and then the pain was uh, incredible. So what can we do um, specifically? Here's some uh, examples. Um, Sarah was talking about laws where you do not criminalize selling sex, you criminalize buying sex. Sweden, this has had a huge impact on trafficking in Sweden. Uh, we've got city ordinances in St. Paul where they went after the, um, the illegal activities that happen in strip clubs, which is really what, what fuels strip clubs. And so they gave, created those ordinances and then all those strip clubs except for one, went over to Minneapolis, the warehouse district, right? So now we're also looking at those ordinances and saying, so what can we change in Minneapolis to change the ordinances to make those strip clubs less profitable and then ultimately closing down? Again, policy. Yeah, and uh, so here we have another root of a policy, and this comes from the, uh, from the Minnesota Department of Health. They did some work with the committee to define what sexual exploitation is. And what they, what they said is that sexually exploitative imagery and advertising depicts or promotes people as sexual objects, valuable primarily as things for others' use. Does that sound familiar, right? Same sort of language we've been using around uh, women who are prostituted, trafficking, um, pornography, and strip clubs. Um, Non-exploitative advertising depicts or promotes people as valuable for their full potential as human beings. Women and men are depicted as equals without sexual objectification, degradation, or violence. So this is really useful that they took the time to actually kind of clarify what we mean by something that is sexually exploitative uh, versus what is, is not, what is, what is a healthy way of promoting um, perhaps joyful, sexy images of, of women and men together. And what we've done with this is really focused on creating a policy that can be used by businesses and organizations um, in the community. And that policy is nearing completion. Um, and the whole idea behind it, right, is we've got a, a, a booklet that's being put together. It has a lot of the data that we've talked about tonight about the harm that comes from sexual exploitation and, and, uh, and buying and selling you know, women and girls. It speaks to American Psychological Association speaking to the degree of harm that comes from a hypersexualized, exploitative um, world that girls are growing up into. We've got all that data. Um, and then we couple that with a policy that uh, businesses or organizations could easily um, implement into their decisions about what sort of marketing they do, what sort of advertising that they do. Um, and then frequently ask questions, right? Because there's bound to be some of those and some common responses to how you deal with those with those questions. And so you can imagine, what if, uh, what if some of the hotels in this community considered some of those advertising policies in the publications maybe that are in their rooms? Um, or in the sorts of things that were sold through their, uh, through their, through their televisions, right? Um, what if the uh, different publications, periodicals, et cetera, et cetera, took a look at what they were advertising for and how uh, people's bodies, particularly women and children's bodies, were used in that, uh, in that sort of advertising. Um, so this policy is meant to be a very useful tool for community members to use and um, find allies who want to implement this sort of strategy, as well as perhaps put some pressures on others who don't, right? One of the first things we did um, uh, with the prior uh, Minnesota Public Health Department. Um, so one of the women there went to a, 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 a conference on sexual violence, went up to her room, and then there was porn. In her room, I'm going, what the heck? I spent all day talking about ending sexual violence. I'm up here, and there it is. Got the Nintendo, got Hollywood hits, and got the adult pay-per-view pornography. So we created a policy, the clean hotel policy. That's, it's a travel policy and an event uh, planning policy. And basically, it says that we will only reimburse employees when they travel, when they stay in hotels that do not sell adult pay-per-view pornography. Now this isn't trying to get people, keep them from looking at porn, they can pull out their phones and look at porn, right? This is about um, getting into the money stream, the revenue stream of trafficking. This is about saying as a, as a um, public entity, whether a county, a city, a district, a state, so we will no longer do business with businesses and put our taxpayer money 
or my private money, whether I'm a college or whether I'm a business, into other businesses that support violence against women. Because we know the research with, uh, with uh, pornography, the correlations between uh, pornography use and increased aggression towards women is the same kind of correlations between smoking and lung cancer. But we got 30 years of research about that, so there's no comparison. So we're saying this is a kind of a divestiture policy. The other thing we're saying, uh, the, the other thing it does is that it says we'll only uh, book events and conventions, conferences, in those convention centers and hotels that do not sell adult pay-per-view pornography. It's very simple. Winona uh, instituted this, Ramsey County has looked at this and is possibly looking at implementing, we've talked to people in Minneapolis, this is something that could easily be done in the city of Duluth and in the county, St. Louis County, right? I've got all the information, all the information you need to enact it and the model policies and procedures are online. I'd be happy to talk to anybody about it. And both of these examples so far are already efforts that have had some interest from individual community members as well as, uh, as through some of the other programs here in the, in the community. So there are real options that a group like a men against trafficking group could take on and help to support. Um, the next thing that we put out there as a possibility is the Mending Project. Um, and the Mending Project, and by the way, there's information about all these efforts in the, uh, on the table at the back there. Um, the Mending Project is still a primary prevention effort because it's specifically focused at engaging men in the community and engaging men in a way where they're going to be interacting and educating and, uh, and creating change around issues of sexual domestic violence and trafficking. Um, but what they specifically do, and this can be a relatively small group of men, really, is they dedicate time to recruiting businesses and, um, well, businesses and organizations to, to donate resources and materials that women who are escaping trafficking, um, women who are escaping abusive relationships or sexual violence, could utilize in that process of, of healing and, uh, and finding safety. So that could be everything from tires, when tires get slashed, right, by the, by the folks who are trying to enforce keeping a woman in, in prostitution, um, uh, tires that are slashed by a batterer. It could include things like therapy services and legal services. It could include changing locks on doors. And so men taking responsibility for some of that harm that's been caused by the sexually exploitative environment that we have and, uh, and gathering those resources and those, and those materials that are, are needed in order to repair the harm. Um, again, with this, all of, the, um, all of the resources that are needed, all the materials that would be utilized in partnership with an advocacy program are available online. There's a whole kind of infrastructure set up in order to make this thing happen. All that we need are some really committed men who are going to uh, take some leadership in making this thing happen. Um, and I know, you know, Chuck, through our work with the Minnesota Men's Action Network, we've got some experience already doing this with, with, with programs. Um, and so finally here, you know, uh, we're reaching the end of our time. I can see the MC moving forward. Um, and so we really want to encourage you to, to get involved um, first of all, by supporting organizations that are addressing trafficking, um, but also, specifically, um, taking some indi individual responsibility for um, ending the demand for trafficking in this community. Um, so we like to say that men have a really unique opportunity and responsibility to take, uh, to take some action towards these issues. And right here and right now is the beginning of something. Because we had a small group of folks who organized this event that kind of coined themselves the Men Against Trafficking Committee. Um, but what we want is a much bigger group of men who are willing to put time and effort into changing the environment and the conditions um, where this trafficking thrives. And so this group is going to be meeting.